Welcome to Zelda Zelda Gaming, my name is Local Linton Keen, and welcome to the first part in a new terrain series covering my new Pelennor Fields gaming board for the Lord of the Rings strategy battle game. We have been incredibly blessed here in Middle Earth, we just got an amazing new edition of our beloved game, and a new box set! A box set that was Pelennor Fields themed, uh, so it just seemed like the right time to dive in and make a really cool Pelennor Fields board that I guess tries to capture one of the most epic moments in cinematic history. Uh, you guys might have seen our Pelennor Fields Bat Rep series where we played through the first four scenarios of the box set, and we have got something truly epic planned for part five. In the Lord of the Rings Armies book, there is a crazy scenario. It's like three and a half thousand points aside and it's played on an eight foot by six foot gaming board and that just got my terrain juices absolutely flowing. But here at Zorbazor we don't do anything by half measure and the thought of an eight foot by six foot board just covered with grass was a little bit bland so I decided to spice things up a little. We've got a whole bunch of extra juicy features. We're talking orc camps, we're talking trenches filled with LED fire and of course the Ramesser core which you can see here before you. Now before we sink our teeth into the meat of this terrain tutorial, we've got some pretty exciting news here at Zorbazor. We are officially launching our Patreon. Now we've had a bunch of requests from you guys in the community about how you can support us, which has been super humbling, and Patreon's always been on the cards for us, but we wanted to kind of show what we could do as a channel and a community and what we can kind of offer the gaming world before launching, so we've put in the last year's worth of solid work to really strut our stuff, and the response that we've gotten from you guys has just been amazing, so we're ready to push the button. Now you guys have all heard the spiel before, we all work full time jobs, creating content takes a lot of time and money, like a lot of money in this case because wargaming and terrain supplies are not cheap. So if you guys uh, want to get behind us and support us that will be amazing, there's a link down to Patreon in the description below. Pledges start from just $1 a month, if you splurge on $5 a month you get access to the Zorbazorb Discord, you can come and hang out with me and the boys, play a bunch of games, chill out in chat while we're painting and modelling, ask me any questions that you like, you can pick my brain to your heart's desire. So if that sounds like something that you would be interested in, jump down into the description and head on over to Patreon to check out all the details. In the meantime, let's get cracking on this terrain. Arise! Arise, riders of Theoden! A sword day! A red day! And the sun! Construction, as always is to start with our basing. I'm going to use my tried and true method of 5mm masonite and then gluing down 30mm extruded polystyrene sheets on top. I usually use 50mm which is a little bit thicker but uh, essentially just for cost I've decided to go down to 30mm uh, with a 6x8 board I need 6-7 sheets I've got here uh, so that's pretty pricey. These are basically 12 bucks a sheet compared to 22 for the thicker stuff. And also, uh, I don't really need the big, thick set stuff because I'm not channeling down into the board and creating any massive kind of crevices or depressions. There might be a few little trenches and dips, but nothing that's going to affect the structural integrity. So this stuff should be absolutely fine, even though it's a bit thinner. Uh, and of course, we have a 6x8 board to deal with as well, which is massive, right? But I'm not going to build that in one piece. Uh, hard to store, not very useful, you're never really going to play on it uh, when it's a massive board like that except on these special scenario occasions. So as always, we love modularity here at Zorbazor. Uh, I'm going to break that up into pieces that can be used for kind of, you know, really 
diverse kind of gameplay elements. So we're going to have a 4x4 four four board in the center, which forms sort of the main center of the battlefield. We're going to have the most kind of mud and churned up and corpses and action there in the middle. Then we'll have another two 2x4 two foot boards on the side of that, which just flow out for the rest of the battlefield. And so that takes us to 4x8. And then up the top, we're going to have another two 2x4 two boards, uh, which take us to the 6x8. And those two are going to be beautiful, dedicated boards that have the Ramus, which is the outer Gondorian wall beyond Minas Tirith that protected, uh, protected the Polenor from invaders. So that will be really nice because that way I can pull those two boards apart and pair them off with the other 2x2s to create two 4x4s that have a nice wall feature and are a great sort of gaming experience. So that will give me three really flexible boards that I can sort of mix and match and, uh, and make for some great versatility for the board. Now it's a pretty uh, easy process to build. Uh, I've run through it a heap of times uh, on the channel. Essentially we're just going to uh, glue our sheets down onto the timber board. I'm going to use uh, liquid nails to get a really strong bond, probably mixing a little bit of PVA there as well to make sure that the bonds are really long lasting. Uh, unfortunately, these foam sheets are slightly smaller than the board, so I'll have to cut a few extra pieces and trim those in so that it's the perfect two by four. Uh, but aside from that, there's nothing really to it. And then we can start to get into layering all that details. But first, let's knock out our base. Alright, so I've left the boards gluing overnight. Now with the combination of the liquid nails and the PVA, that means I can actually start to work with them a little bit already. Uh, the liquid nails creates kind of like a, a reasonably good tactile bond in about 12 to 24 hours uh, that will stop everything from falling apart. And then within about 24 to 48 hours, the PVA will be fully bonded. Uh, which will be lovely and then in seven days the uh, liquid nails will turn from a tactile bond to a really strong cure and we'll have a really solid safe gaming piece that isn't going to fall apart. Now of course we've got our board, we've got the foundations the next thing to think about is the design of what's actually going to be on the board. And uh, obviously we're designing this Pelennor Fields board to replicate that big 6x8 foot board for the scenario in the Army's book. Uh, but if you have a look at that scenario, I mean essentially it's just a grass field, uh, which isn't that exciting, having 6x8 feet of grass field. So I really wanted to find ways to add a lot of character into the board, uh, uh, create some really cool features and some cool pieces that make it a really great landscape to play on. Again, uh, creating modular there are elements that can be other boards as well, but of course don't break the scenario. So obviously our first point of reference is to look at our source material. Uh, usually PJ's films are a great place to start. Ironically in this case, they shot the Pelennor Fields just in some fields at the back of Twizel in the middle of the South Island and it's literally just a grassy field. Uh, there are some really key features uh, of the Pelennor that weren't really included and, and if we go to Tolkien, our Lord and Master, uh, we find some really great ideas. Obviously the first kind of big point that PJ just didn't include at all was the Ramus Echo, which is uh, an outer wall uh, set, you know, several leagues out from the actual walls of Minas Tirith itself, which encircles the field of the Paleno, which is essentially rural pasture land and farming land for uh, the farms of Gondor, so they can feed the, the citizens of Minas Tirith and the surrounding regions. And that Ramus Echo protects that entire district uh, and it's, you know, a really serious wall and, and it's, uh, it's kind of in a, a state of disrepair at the time of War of the Ring and, and Denethor is trying to get it repaired in time for the oncoming, oncoming onslaught uh, and, you know, there's some really, really cool uh, potential there for a really great element to go on the board. There's also the Causeway Forts, which is essentially just a gatehouse uh, in the centre of the Ramus Echo, where the road from, the kind of east-west road essentially, from Minas Tirith to Osgiliath passes through, uh, so that can be something really awesome to include as well. And then in the field lands, like yes it's grassy fields, but there's sort of stuff we can do with that. When the orcs arrive there, they, they start burning stuff so we can have bits of scorched earth. Um, of course there's farms, so we're looking at homesteads and little Gondorian buildings that we can have little burnt wrecks, and, and those can all be floating pieces too, so they don't have to be glued down to the board, but just little elements that we can put in place to kind of have a bit more of a tactical play rather than a big wide open field sort of stuff to interact with. Uh, and then the big one is the orcs presence on, on the field of the Palenor. When they arrive, Tolkien says that they 
dig ditches and fill them with fire and uh, you know uh, sort of just outside of bow shot of the walls and then they sit behind them and they build little orc camps and set up tents and and really start to make their presence felt uh, and that gives us a really cool opportunity to build some great stuff and a really cool chance to build some fire which is going to be super cool I haven't built like fake fire before uh, but I've got a pretty sweet idea on how we're going to achieve it using some LED lighting and some resin and then kind of blending some more uh, existing techniques like cotton wool smoke and all that kind of stuff. So we're going to have a look at that a bit later on, which is going to be really sick. But what we're going to do is we're going to start with the Ramus Echor. Now the first thing I did after kind of brainstorming all these ideas is start to put together a bit of a plan, uh, kind of map out. Obviously I know how my boards are going to fit together, but where are my pieces going to go? Uh, so essentially we're going to have a central field uh, with uh, the road running through the center of the board. We'll have the causeway forts and the Ramus uh, on the top section of the board and the causeway forts just so that they're all on one board and not split down the middle will just be favoured slightly to the left and then on our central board this is going to be our main kind of fieldy area uh, we've got the road kind of moving its way through and then we can have some orc trenches filled with fire some orc camps and then we'll have uh, a few kind of uh, fields and farms and more kind of feel the area off to the side on the other halves uh, to give us that flexibility of moving those plates around later so they match up nicely with the Ramesset core pieces. So we're going to start with the two 2x4 two foot boards that form the eastern board edge uh, which has the Ramesset core and the road coming into the causeway forts. Essentially this is a great place to start because these boards have a bit of everything that we're going to be seeing. Uh, obviously we've got the focal point of the Ramus itself which is a great kind of starting point to build the board out from and we've got planes, we've got a bit of the road, we'll have some kind of burnt building stuff as well. Uh, so it gives us a sample of everything to really define our build process as we move forward into the larger parts of the board. Now obviously the biggest part of all is the Ramus Ecor, uh, and when we're kind of thinking about the actual design of this, we have to think about the scenario that we're building it for, and obviously there is no wall in this scenario, so the wall needs to be enough of a feature to be cool and to be visual and to affect playing a little bit, but it can't be game breaking. So the first thing I did was look at the scenario, and on turn 5 we've got a massive horde of Haradrim, three Mumakils, and lots of raiders led by Suladen. Uh, they're coming onto the board from the east, and of course traditionally they could just come on anywhere because there isn't anything in their way. So we need to have the Ramesset core in such a ruined state that uh, it, it very rarely impedes Mumical movement. Like we might have, you know, the causeway forts will still be a fairly large structure because they're a bigger fortification, the Orcs haven't pulled them down as much, but lots and lots of holes in the wall that the Mumakil and the Haradrim and eventually, you know, the hordes of Rohirrim can get through as well. And that's all completely true to Tolkien as well. The, the Orcs got there and they were sort of sitting there for about a day waiting for the armies to all filter through the Ramesset core and get onto the main planes and build the body of the army. And they were just pulling down the wall while they were there and absolutely wrecking it. Uh, so, yeah, it's definitely going to be really true to form. Uh, now, how are we going to build this? We're going to go to the classic, wonderful, super amazing Hearst Arts, Hearst Arts Moulds. Uh, we've got uh, lots and lots of bricks here that I've already cast. If you guys haven't seen how this whole process works, uh, check out my uh, Arnor Ruin uh, video. I'll link it in the description below. Um, and that, that I go through in detail the whole casting process. Uh, essentially, we have a, a series of silicon molds uh, that make us these beautiful little bricks, and this is all just cast from uh, a really high tensile strength plaster, so they're absolutely durable as. Uh, if you, they're really great because you can weather them, just hack at them with some pliers, get a chisel in there and break them apart. And essentially, it's just like Lego, right? You know, we can just sit them all together and, and build up little walls and bricks and, and make a really cool structure. I'm just going to glue them together with PVA, uh, so they're, they're really, really user-friendly. So we've got lots of different designs, uh, lots of arches and bricks and Gondorian architecture, but of course, something that makes the Ramus and all of the walls of Gondor and Minas Tirith really stand out are the battlements. So I've got a pretty awesome little piece, well, series of awesome pieces here, which are a custom build, uh, and these are the Minas Tirith battlements, which uh, a friend of mine, Angelo, uh, he 3D printed these for me. Um, I'll give you guys a, a close-up here so you can really have a good look at them. And they're absolutely awesome. They've got, you know, a really great shape. Uh, essentially, he just did a, a big design in, in CAD and, uh, and printed them using his 3D printer. And they're really sexy. So I'm just going to start sketching out where all the walls going to go and start making a bit of a plan on these two boards and start mocking up my little uh, little wall pieces with the Hearst Arts bricks. Uh, and then we'll 
I'll uh, come back and have a look at our more solidified plan moving forwards. Because uh, I've been talking for a bit of a while, so let's get into doing some stuff. Okay, so I've kind of really roughed out whereabouts the wall is going to sit and I'm going to start by building up the causeway forts and getting those two towers happening and then we'll start to build the ruin wall out from there. So the assembly of our gatehouse and our walls is a pretty simple process. It takes a little bit of time and it can be a little bit fiddly, but if you just put the hours in, you'll get a really great result. So once we've uh, taken our Hearst Arts mould here and cast up a whole selection of bricks, uh, we can start getting to build. Primarily for this, we're going to be using just the basic brick set, uh, which comes with our three-piece bricks, some two-piece bricks, and a whole lot of one-piece bricks. Uh, and essentially, we just begin to build our tower structure. As you can see, I've completed the first one uh, over here on the right. Now, uh, it's, you know, standard masonry techniques. We just line up all our bricks and we start to glue them down in place. Uh, with the design of the Gondorian Towers, obviously they're octagonal, so we're going to need some right angle joins. And to do that, the wonderful thing about using a good quality plaster like a, a Hydrostone or a Hydrokel uh, with a really high tensile strength is that if you need to make any uh, right angles, you just take a chisel and a hammer and you just line it up and you sit it there on the top at the desired sort of angle and holding firm on the chisel so that you keep the downward motion and it doesn't slip and create, well, it doesn't often slip and create a curve. And then we get uh, an edge like that, which is a little bit wonky. So we just take the chisel and scrape it down. And there we go. We've got a perfectly 45 degree angle or perfect enough for our means. And, uh, and then we can just butt up our pieces like so and there we get the 45. And then we just do that as we work around. Of course, when we're building our brick structures, we want to be overlapping our brick seams so that uh, no two bricks are directly on top of each other, just like building a normal brick wall. I'm sure you guys can handle that. Um, and of course, when we are breaking our uh, longer sections off the corners of bricks, you always want to keep the small little uh, triangles that come off because you'll need them on the next section interlinking as you begin to space the bricks around. Uh, so I'm going to jump into gluing that and uh, getting our second tower up and running. So I glued this stuff together with essentially just a PVA, uh, but it's called Weld Bond, and it's a really high tensile strength PVA. So it's got all of the great uh, sort of properties of the thickness, the viscosity, the way that it flows. Um, it's, it's fantastic material, but it cures sort of really loosely in about 20 minutes, which gives you enough to kind of just hold the, all the bricks in place as you start to build your tower up, which is really important because you don't want it all falling apart while you're working on it. And it means you don't have to glue down a layer of weight, glue down a layer late. Blah. And then after about, you know, 24 hours, just like normal PVA, it is absolutely rigid and you get a really nice bond. So uh, yeah, just, you know, don't be shy with the glue, really slather it on and get big thick layers on there because that guarantees that you're going to get really great bonds between all the materials and it sort of moves in and, and fills up all the gaps. And don't stress if you get a whole heap of it splurging in on the inside of the tower, because of course we're never going to see that. So uh, you can be as liberal as you like. And the, a bottle for this size, definitely more expensive, it's about 20 bucks Australian, uh, instead of, you know, uh, I think you get about 4 litres of normal PVA for that price uh, here in Australia. But um, it's, yeah, it's definitely worth it because of the strength of the bond that you get. So once you finish the main section of your tower, the next point is to start working with your battlements. Now they're just going to be gluing on straight on here, but of course uh, these guys are 3D printed for me, so I had to uh, spend a bit of time planing back that 3D printing texture, because you get all of those kind of, not mould lines, they're essentially the bead lines of the, of the uh, material being deposited by the 3D printer. It doesn't look very natural or very rocky, and as soon as we start to hit this with a dry brush and painting it, they're going to be so obvious. So we want to plane all those back and really match our stone. So uh, I'll chuck in some close-ups of these so that you guys can see, but essentially if we do a compare the pair, uh, we've got some serious lines on that one, and then to take it all off, I just get my Dremel and I just plane back all of that material, really working it and smoothing it down, particularly in the center of the bricks, making sure I'm not taking too much off so that you're kind of losing the contrast ratio and losing all the detail, uh, particularly around the joins. You're probably just going to have to wear a little bit around those, but that's not too bad. 
And, uh, and then once we've gotten most of that, just really start hitting that Dremel in and kind of taking little chunks out and making it really rough uh, to, to match the kind of pattern of the stone. And then of course we have to think about the fact that this is, you know, a completely ruined wall. It's been sieged, besieged and ripped apart by the orcs. So taking lots of chunks off and, and big pieces like that and and putting, you know, basically lots and lots of wear and tear because we really got to tell the story of this board and uh, and really capture the events that have happened here and the aging is a crucial key of that. So I'll chuck in uh, some more detailed close work of that now. If you're going to be dremeling plastic, make sure you're wearing proper stuff, eye protection and filters because uh, this stuff is really gross and will get straight in your lungs and not be very nice to breathe in. see the difference between the uh, completely untouched one and then the weathered one. We've just knocked back all of that 3D printing texture and really put a lot of that stone texture in which should match this stuff quite nicely. Alright, so I finished dremeling all of my balustrade pieces to give them that nice kind of rocky texture which really nicely matches our Hearst Arts pieces. Now the kind of final touch for them is to just hit them really lightly with a bit of sandpaper just to take away all those kind of really jagged pieces that get created from the dremel because uh, that's kind of a real giveaway that the material is actually plastic. Uh, and then sometimes there'll be a few little areas where we've created holes or opened up real kind of obvious sections of the 3D printing. Uh, we don't have to worry about those just yet, we'll come back later and kind of fill those all in with putty once we've got them on the top of our tower. Now, the next thing I've done on my tower is I've just made essentially what's going to be our floor, which is just made up uh, of a whole uh, lot of half height Hearst Arts tiles. I just kind of arrange them in a bit of a pattern and, and use my chisel once again to cut it perfectly to size. And that's just all set on a piece of uh, three millimeter foam core, um, which is just strong enough to hold the weight and it's not too thin as well, so it doesn't set our wall straight up. And we will just PVA with our uh, weld bond, that straight down on top. Maybe use a bit of liquid nails as well to kind of pin it in around the corner so we get a really strong bond there because we're never going inside these towers. And then we're going to start taking our pieces, which are now ready to go, and start to uh, kind of building our, our battlements around. Now you'll notice that as we've layered this, it's brought it up even higher, so we're just going to have to make sure we line it up perfectly so that the archways are 100% over the top of the stonework. And also, I mean, the thing to note with is these things weren't designed to work 100% with uh, her starts. They were kind of a piece from a full 3D printed set that my main Angelo was working on, and uh, and so they, they aren't the perfect size work with these blocks. So as I start to glue them in, uh, I'm going to use a combination of tacking the sides with a, a more instant super glue uh, and perhaps I'll even have to dremel a few of them to change the angle slightly but essentially it's just going to be uh, glue to fit and building and working my way around and making each piece work uh, with the next one as I move around and then if I have any problems with ever connecting anything I can always just make it look damaged and ruined to hide the join and get away with it which is really nice uh, kind of on the whole as a build technique because uh, we're building such a ruined structure a lot of these joins and things that look a bit clumsy we'll clean them up a little bit to kind of hint to the quality Gondorian stonework but anything that's unsalvageable will just make it look really damaged anyway I'm going to glue that down and start assembling the battlements So the board's coming along quite nicely. We've got our first little section of complete wall here attached to the first causeway fort. It's just got a little bit of damage there which is going to flow on into the next board and kind of rubble down. And then the second causeway fort is coming along quite well. Now the primary build phase of this is pretty much over. We've got all of the structural stone in and our balustrades, but obviously you'll notice there's a massive hole in the in the tower here. So this guy's going to be really ruined and essentially, you know, the Witch King's flown over and smashed some stuff into it and, and really blasted it open and then that will flow down into a massive hole in the wall where lots of troops and mumakil and all sorts of stuff can move through. So we've got two kind of flow points through the board and then we'll have a little bit that comes back up here with like a tiny little piece of battlement or, or something like that. So essentially, once this is all glued and cured, the next phase is to um, 
begin putting in some foam layers that kind of space out and block out the sections so that we don't have to fill all of this, right? Because this is all going to be rubble and broken brick and collapsed internal stairways. So essentially I'll just get some sheets of foam and kind of plant them off and put them on an angle in here and glue them in so that then I can build rubble on top of it without having to fill the entire cavity because it's massive. And we'll do the same in here on the towers. You can actually see I've started to use some spaces here. This is just some normal foam and I'm doing that because essentially it saves bricks, right? This tower is going to be exploded. There's going to be rubble everywhere all over here and I can confidently say that I'm never going to see these bricks down here because there's going to be so much rubble piled up on either side against the wall. So I just put some foam down there that's the same dimensions as bricks and put bricks on top of them and that saves me you know 20 bricks each time I do that so uh, that's a convenient little method just because otherwise you're going to be casting forever and ever everywhere you can save bricks you definitely should so once this is cured I'm going to start uh, putting in my foam walls and building up the rubble which I'll show you when uh, in detail when we get there and also uh, putting on kind of the final layer of structural stone or more of a finishing stone really which is just building up on all of these layers uh, with bricks that I have weathered and aged to, to kind of begin the damaging process and flow into all of the rubble. So we'll have a look at that in just a second. Alright, so as you can see, I've smashed through and done this section of the wall as well, and that way I'm going to be able to treat the rest of this whole wall as one sort of piece, and then move through the next phase in stages. Now I've done all of my dressing stone and my finishing stone to kind of really capture the ruined edge of the buildings, and, and everywhere there's been a broken stone, I've just taken my chisel and really carved some cool contours to make a really kind of angular rock face. And we're going to move on to the next section and get our gate happening, and start building that up and over. So I'm going to jump into the gate, and then will ruin the whole board. Up next we're going to make a roof for our little stable here. It's going to be pretty simple but we want it to be completely removable so we can take it on and off. It doesn't have to be glued in and that way it's much more accessible for playability. Uh, we're just going to make a frame out of balsa wood. This is just like a square rod that will uh, create some trusses and some triangle frames uh, to build the structure. And then we'll put down some balsa sheeting as our panelling and uh, that'll uh, be the surface that we'll glue our shingles to. And it also allows us to put in some detail on the inner side of the roof so that when we remove it, it still looks nice and cool and it's a completely sealed terrain piece rather than, you know, pulling it open and seeing some cereal box on the inside or something like that just because it's coming off and on so much we want it to look really cool and then on the outside of that timber uh, sheeting we're going to put down a whole bunch of roof shingles in the kind of nice square Gondorian style and that's just going to be a whole bunch of cardboard cut up into little tiles and then glued on with hot glue so nothing crazy complicated so the first thing to do is to measure up our frame uh, for our trusses now we want them to go uh, we want our, our roof shingles to hang off the edge so we want the frames to go all the way to the end of the building uh, and then that'll allow our timber sheeting and then our shingles to hang over the edge of the eaves essentially. We'll probably make probably three frames to sit across the space. When you're cutting balsa, always use a really nice sharp scalpel. Um, otherwise you just get lots of tearing in the fibres of the wood because obviously it's a very lightweight timber. Alright, so now we've got our balsa frame just whacked together with a bit of hot glue and that slots absolutely perfectly straight into our roof and uh, it's the right amount of size that it's, it's not a, a really snug fit and it's not crazy loose so it'll be really easy to pull in and out when we're gaming and uh, it's got enough support there to be nice and strong uh, but if you smash it, it will fall apart but luckily when we put our planks and roofing on it'll really give it a lot more structural integrity. So up next we're going to start to put our balsa sheeting down before we put our roof tiles on. So we're just going to use uh, a nice thin balsa, this is just 2mm and because uh, we're only going to be detailing one side so it doesn't have to be really thick uh, we'll cut that to size all the way up to the end of the trusses and then before we glue it down we'll start scoring in just a bit of a timber pattern so that when we turn it over it looks like that there's some timber planks underneath the shingles. So let's start measuring this guy up, we'll get rid of all this crap out of the way. Beautiful, so that's nice and snug on there. And now what we're going to do, just using the tip of our pencil and our ruler, is we're going to go in 
and just draw in a bunch of little planks, just pushing in reasonably hard to create a nice channel into the timber, but not so hard that we go all the way through the balsa, because we don't want to damage it and uh, tear it in half. Try and keep your panels relatively even. Uh, when these roofs will be built, it would be with relatively standard pieces of timber, but you don't want them to be absolutely perfect because a bit of natural variation always helps with that realism. There's nothing worse than having bits of terrain that look like they were made by a machine, because uh, it's all in those little details that creates the high level of realism. There we go, so there's our little timber planks, and they're going to go on the inside of the roof facing down, so that when we look up at it, uh, when we pull the roof off, it's got a little bit of detail in there. I'm going to finish the rest of the planks and we'll glue these all down. Alright, so here's our little frame with the cladding on. As you can see in there, we've just got some nice little timber detail, which is just going to look a bit cooler than a boring old cereal box or something on the inside when we pull that off. And that sits in nicely and locks into place quite nice and snug. Now I've just put an extra little piece on the end here just so that when we're looking down through the stairs here, uh, we can uh, not see kind of into the roof because obviously that would be completely enclosed. And now what we're going to do is start our shingles. Our shingles are super easy. We're just going to uh, take our piece of cardboard and a ruler and start cutting ourselves uh, a reasonable length strip, about 5mm wide. Just cut a whole heap of them. And the best thing to do is to just focus on making a whole bunch of tiles for about 20 minutes and then you'll be set to just glue them all on. And then we take our little strips and we're just going to cut them into little pieces that are longer than they are wide so that they've got enough room to be glued on top of each other uh, and sit down and leave a nice space of shingles. So I'm going to start making, you know, 50, 100, 500, 10,000, a billion shingles and uh, we'll, uh, we'll get glowing on the roof. So once I've finished cutting out all our shingles, I'm just going to grab my hot glue gun and start applying them to the roof one at a time. And uh, I'm always going to work from the bottom up so that I can put the next layer overlapping on top of the ones underneath. Make sure nothing's sitting too perfectly. You want stuff to be sort of slid around and, and kind of off kilter, overlapping in different ways just so you get a nice variation on the roof shingles. All the shingles are on and that is our roof completed. I did have to actually make a few adjustments to the inside trusses just so that uh, it didn't sit too high above the prow of the building. I forgot to take into account the thickness of the uh, timber sheeting and the tiles when I made the initial framing, which is a mistake that you guys can now avoid. Uh, so that way uh, it sits nice and flush with the stone roofing and we don't have you know a big triangle of roof sitting up above, so it looks much better. Make sure when you guys are putting it on, you know, leave a few holes and shingles sliding down and kind of adds a, a bit of character rather than it just being completely flat and symmetrical, uh, particularly when you're building sort of the Ramus and, and this little sort of stable guardhouse. Obviously, these walls have been in disrepair for years, uh, so they wouldn't have been fixing shingles on the roof. So a bit of hodgepodge quality on the uh, shingles is always going to look good. So achieving realistic looking rubble is a challenge that terrain makers have been battling with for many years and it's all about uh, striking that balance of being able to make something that looks really cool and is still really playable. So what we're going to do is go through all of the steps of creating really nice looking rubble that suits this gorgeous kind of stone wall and, and kind of medieval style of rubble but is also uh, really great. You know your miniatures aren't falling over and, uh, and not being able to stand on any of it. So essentially there's two main processes. First we use uh, like a bulk uh, material, which in our case is going to be like a wood putty or a water putty. Uh, you can also use something like sculpt mold uh, to kind of flesh out all of the, the kind of curvature of where the rubble has fallen and give ourselves like a mound of crap just to build our detailed layers on. And then that gives the rubble a lot of volume, but none of that stuff's ever actually going to be seen because we end up burying it in smaller pieces. Uh, and that way, you know, we can really contour the shape of the rubble and imply that there's a hell of a lot of rock and stuff that's fallen off these towers as they've been uh, smashed apart by the Mordor forces. And then we apply our detail layers, uh, which just like whenever we're applying rubble to miniature bases, uh, we go through sort of three different sizes, putting our big stuff and then our medium stuff and then our fine stuff and build up that really nice detail layer, which is sort of almost... I, 
places like an inch thick of different types of rubble over the top of that mounded stuff and then together those elements create a really nice looking rubble texture but because of the way that the different size rubbles sort of lock together it starts to kind of fill it out a little bit and make sure that it's not too crazy and not too lumpy so that stuff can't stand and then the third step is to come in and seal the crap out of it really get some good layers of glue in there we'll pump in a whole bunch of kind of watered down PVA mixture and really seal the whole element so that it's one big chunk of like rock and glue and uh, it's absolutely solid nothing's going to come peeling off and uh, from there we'll be able to kind of make our final choices on balancing out the smoothness of the rubble versus uh, all of the textural elements that we want in there and we'll get a really cool looking rubbled surface uh, which should quite suit our you know big ruined towers because we've got big opportunities here right like this tower's had heaps of it blasted out so we can have a big pile coming down here and all these walls sort of have been blown back in so there should be big piles on the insides of the walls so there's a lot of fun stuff we can do so the first thing we're going to need to do is prepare all the elements we need for our volume layer the first thing of course is the volume itself, we're just going to be using a filler. This is uh, Agnew's water putty, my classic go-to filler. Wood putty, water putty, sculptor mold, big chunky plastery stuff. Anything's fine, whatever you prefer to use as your kind of volume filler. I just have heaps of this left over, so that's what we're using today. And uh, we'll be mixing that all up, just water and putty together, till we get a nice kind of consistency that allows us to really smoosh it in and apply. We've got to make sure we cover all of these foam areas that we left hidden, uh, and really kind of begin to bulk out the rubble pile. Uh, as we're doing that, we're also going to be uh, kind of digging in a few sort of select ruined bits of rock so that we can have some stuff kind of half sunk into that rubble pile and, and they're the beginnings of our rubble detail they're bigger pieces um, that way we can have stuff that's really like half submerged in lots of fine gravel um, and it really kind of it, it helps bring the detail layer into the volume layer and helps to begin merge them rather than just having you know obviously a mounted pile of stuff that we've just glued stuff onto because it's all about implying the depth of that rubble and that's really important so what we're going to do is take a whole bunch of our uh, cast tiles uh, or cast pieces uh, and just hack at them with a chisel and with a hammer and uh, and really kind of make them ruin like they've been blasted off the wall and then as we're applying our putty we can start to sink them right in. Now one thing to note is that uh, as we hack at them we're also going to save all the other little bits that come off them. Uh, as I, you can see I've been doing as I've been working on all the other bits. Uh, where's the camera? We've got some gorgeous little rubble there, so we're just going to be continuing to add to that pile because every piece of broken bit that comes off, we're eventually going to put back into the model and glue it in, it's because it did come off those pieces that we were ruining. So in terms of ruining them, it's, it's super easy. You can do it by hand, get your chisel in there, just start taking off those corners and really gouging into them. Um, it's yeah, quite therapeutic, really. <laughs> um, really start to kind of hack away at them. And, uh, and then of course you've got, if you want to take real chunks off, just get your hammer and chisel and start whacking them apart. And of course they will go flying everywhere, so make sure that you're wearing uh, lots of eye protection. Alright, that's all our little small pieces done. They can all look quite nice. Now we need to make our bulk and start to mix up our water putty. I just do this by eye um, and just sort of match it until we've got the right kind of consistency. Chuck a fair bit in because we're going to be working with pretty serious volumes. Go. And now we just slowly add our water and mix it together until we get a really nice consistency that looks like it's going to be good to work with. You don't want it too dry because then it all falls apart and flakes off. You don't want it too wet either because then it's slush and it just won't hold any volume or any form. There we go, let's get good. Dry that out a bit. That is perfect. So that's sort of the consistency that we're looking for. Well mixed, well bonded, with a lot of grit in there so that it's got a fair bit of texture. Because uh, we do want it to have a reasonable amount of texture just in case we do see any of it. So I'm just going to start by applying uh, around all the areas that I know we're definitely going to have big piles of rubble. Uh, because we've put foam there. <laughs> and obviously this tower has been completely wrecked a bit as well. There's going to be a fair bit of stuff piling up around there. See, obviously I just use my big spatula for applying it most of the time, uh, just because it's obviously 
a lot better, but then I've got a little fine guy that I go in there with uh, when I start to playing a bit more seriously. So this stuff dries sort of quickly, so you've got to start to work probably in, in reasonable sized chunks, not the whole board at a time, uh, if we want to start pressing stuff into it and texturing it. So just as an example, you know, say this area was finished, we'll then start to just go in and, and chuck a few little bits of, of ruined rock in there with the nice textured sides facing up. Remembering that we're going to pile heaps more crap on this, so it doesn't have to be amazing, but it's just to, to kind of begin to bring all that detail into these layers, and, and it'll really help blend the two layers of, of rubble. Something like that. Awesome. All right, I'm going to smash the rest of the board, and we'll get this first big molded volume layer down. So our volume layer of water putty is down. It cures pretty quickly to a point of workability in about sort of 30 or 40 minutes, and then it's like fully bonded rock hard all the way through uh, after about three hours. But it's pretty great because you, you can sort of start on one piece and by the time you've caught all the way around the board, it's usually uh, dry and hard enough to keep going with the next layer. So now we start to put down our layers of rubble. So our first question is, what's our rubble gonna be made from? As you know, uh, I've been kind of keeping all the bits left over uh, from chipping away all of our stuff. So uh, that's kind of where the bulk of our rubble is going to come from, or at least the bulk of our really detailed pieces. And I've also gone and, and chiseled a whole bunch of extra bits, so we've got some really nice sizable bits that we can just glue straight down. So those are going to form the largest kind of versions of our rubble, and they're all just going to be kind of covered in and glued in uh, and smashed all around this stuff to complement the stuff that we already have in there. And then our next kind of mid-layer of rubble is going to be primarily of broken pieces uh, that have come off during chiseling and weathering. Uh, and then also we're going to have uh, some more of that and then the final layer made from essentially some scratch rubble that we're going to make ourselves. This stuff is super easy to make. Uh, if you've been doing any of this build or anything similar, you're going to have a lot of plaster uh, and you're going to have a lot of miscasts and overspills and, and all that sort of stuff. So in this box here, I have all the spilled bits of plaster that have come off my moulds, all the bits that have been left in the bottom of the bucket when I've made too much or too little, and I've just been chucking that in this box for a long time, and now I've got so much crap in there. So what I'm gonna do is just grab uh, all of the kind of biggest, sort of thicker bits of that, because we don't want the really thin stuff uh, for this kind of build, because there's not really any thin shearing sort of materials. So all this super thin stuff probably isn't gonna look that right, but these thicker bits, particularly stuff, you know, like this, and, and I mean, definitely, this kind of stuff, we'll just get all of that into uh, a Ziploc bag uh, and then we just start to smash it up and really shake it around and give it a good weathering inside the bag, keeps it nice and neat, uh, um, but it also keeps us, it also gives it the benefit of kind of rounding off a lot of the edges as they break um, because they're all being knocked about together, it takes off a lot of the sharpness which starts to kind of age it and make it look a bit more natural uh, rather than those really jagged edges. So I'm going to start doing that. created some really nice uh, kind of mid-size and, and really small rubble. So now what we'll do is we'll start to apply our rubble in layers, starting with our bigger layers and our, uh, our really big detail pieces. So what I'm going to do is just kind of pull a lot of that stuff out, leaving all of the loose stuff down in the bottom of the bucket. Now what we're going to do is put down just a big layer of uh, solid pure PVA uh, all over uh, every area that we're going to rubble, and then we build our layers on top of that, and then we'll come back and start layering in a, a, a kind of PVA water solution over the top as our sealant. But first up, it's pure PVA, uh, which we're just going to get on here, and then spread around with our brush. I'm just going to pour it straight on. And then we'll just get that all in here. It doesn't have to be perfect because obviously we're going to be sealing on top, but this is just going to make uh, essentially like a, a bottom layer to kind of give it all a big, nice, gluey base. Now because I'm using proper, just normal, long drying PVA, I can literally cover the whole thing and not have to worry about it. 
evaporating too hard because I'm not working with that big of an area. On the surfaces that are quite vertical, um, don't bother really soaking any PVA into that stuff because not much is going to stick there. We'll come back and texture that with some kind of stone finished paint later on. Uh, otherwise, you'll just have a kind of, you know, pure PVA is pretty glossy when it dries and, and then that'll get all over, uh, all over those side joints and just makes a bit more work for us to clean up later that we don't need to do. Alright, so that's our PVA in. Now we just start to have a bit of fun and start sprinkling all of our junk everywhere, getting it right into all of those joints. Uh, make sure that I've got some really nice big broken stair pieces. I'm going to make sure that they are on the inside of the wall where the stairs would have been. Um, all that kind of detail and thought is always handy as you start to go into this. But essentially just start piling your big stuff on. So these are the last of my wall pieces. I'll start putting them on now and mixing them in with the kind of bigger and medium pieces of these. Uh, the great thing about these is they've got a bit more texture because they're from my actual casting block. So you want to see these on the top and these kind of underneath. So I'll work in an inner layer with these and then start to finish them with the detail pieces. Don't worry if some of it looks loose, it's all going to seal up absolutely beautifully once we get all our gorgeous glue layers in there. Now the final layer of rubble that we're going to apply is some tile grout. Now tile grout's really awesome because it's a really nice fine particulate uh, which makes for like the, the best sort of final layer stage of our rubble but it's also an adhesive. It's got bonding agents in it that kind of help all the tiles seal together when you're using it traditionally for grouting and that's really great for us because it blends out all of the mid-size and large size kind of rubble pieces because of its really small grain size but it also kind of nestles in there and once we start pumping it full of PVA glue the adhesive and bonding agents in it just give it an extra binding factor that really ties together all of these you know really still quite loose stones into a big chunk of glue basically, and it really solidifies that whole rubble section. So, what we're going to do is just grab a big handful of it and just kind of, you know, drift it everywhere that you want a bit of that rubble and, and don't worry too much about, you know, if it's, if it's covering too much because as the rest of our stuff sort of flows in, that's all going to get pushed down into the grooves, but we just want a good healthy smattering of it all over the rubble and that will help bring everything together really nicely, tie out all of those disparities in the different uh, heights and sizes of rubbles and make it look like it's, you know, just been blasted apart. So the final stage of our rubble is to hit all of these loose pieces with a big layer of glue and adhesive to make sure we lock everything down. We don't want any of these pieces pulling out while we're painting or playing. We want these uh, terrain boards to have a really long shelf life and we want everything to be locked in. So we're going to apply a massive layer. We're just going to soak the whole board in a watered down PVA. This is a really strong PVA mixture. We're sort of probably like 60-40 PVA heavy, maybe 50-50, somewhere in that vicinity. Lots and lots of glue in there and obviously the water to give it that flow. But before we start soaking, Soaking that stuff, uh, we're going to apply some alcohol to the board. Now, uh, this is just an ethanol mixture. It's like a cleaning spray, actually, a medical cleaning spray, but you can get any sort of alcohol, isopropyl alcohol. Um, you could even use like a really high purity, neat alcohol if you didn't have any kind of industrial stuff like vodka, probably one of the high 40% spirits. Don't dilute it. Um, this uh, essentially acts as uh, it creates a capillary action through all the rubble, um, which gives uh, the PVA the ability to flow right down through all the pieces and get right into the base layer and lock everything down. So we're just going to start hitting this stuff and just giving it a really nice soak. It's just alcohol, so don't stress. It's not going to damage any of the plaster or the rubble or any of that. So don't be afraid to get it right in there. 
That's that done. Okay, so now we're on to our PVA action. This is just one of my old empty Weld Bond bottles, so I actually did just use normal PVA. Um, I just like it because you can sort of put a whole lot together and you don't have to keep sort of syringing up and down. Um, but yeah, any, any kind of easy action application would work. And you just want to make sure you really soak absolutely everywhere. Let it get in there. See it really soaking in and getting down through those lower layers because of the alcohol. It smells really good too. <laughs> it's going to be messy, just uh, yeah, get on board with it. Alright, so that's all soaked in. I'm going to leave that overnight and we'll see how that glue dries and locks in. It might take a couple more coats. Hopefully we can do it in two. I'll hit it with another one in the morning. But for now, let's let it dry and see what it looks like tomorrow. So one more thing I'm going to do tonight while we wait for our rubble to dry is make a start on the road. Now this road is a pretty significant feature, not just of this board, but of the entire six foot by eight foot board. Uh, it comes through the gate here and then runs all the way across the Palinor and then off to Minas Tirith. So it's a really cool feature um, and it, it's kind of going to add something to the board and, and, and give it a, a bit of a visual break from all the fields and grass uh, without having like a massive gameplay impact. So it's, it's a cool little feature um, and it's going to be, it's going to be pretty fun to make. Make. What we're going to do is we're going to use uh, this guy who I've just picked up and this is a Green Stuff Roller from Green Stuff World and essentially it's just a cylindrical rolling pin that has a texture imprinted upon it and we can pugs kind of put down any sort of surface and then just roll this into it and the surface will take on that texture and take a really cool pavement. Now I've done a little bit of test piece here in uh, Wood Putty which I'll show you guys up there and you can have a little look at and it absolutely looks really gorgeous. You can see all the incredible tiles and the great definition. If I was to hand carve that it would take me hours. So it's an absolutely invaluable little tool. We're going to be able to just sculpt a little channel of Wood Putty which is what I'm going to be using uh, wherever we want the road to go and then just roll the pin straight over it and the Wood Putty will take that texture. Uh, it's pretty cheap as well. I imported it from New Zealand uh, and it cost me about 35 bucks including shipping uh, and you know all the million taxes like the GST fuck you Malcolm Turnbull and uh, so it's it's really cheap considering the amount of time that it would save me if I was to hand carve that it would just take forever so it's gonna be really exciting and it just gives a really cool finish as well now um, the guys have uh, at uh, I think they made it in Spain the company green stuff world they've gone to like you know a lot of detail it's not just a uniform pattern there's a few little tiles that uh, you know really damaged you can actually see it better on the, uh, the wood putty mold. There's a couple of tiles there that have got nicks out of them and chips and, and it's, you know, it's, it's not all uniform. There's a, a lot of character um, in the mold. So what I'm going to do now is start uh, taking a whole bunch of wood putty and just making a nice road section that we'll then roll into. The only thing that's going to be challenging is when we get to the gate because obviously a rolling pin doesn't fit through. Uh, so what I'm going to have to do is uh, sculpt a little section that's the right dimensions and then roll that out and then put it in there and then I'll have to uh, butt that up against my two road sections. Now I'm never going to line up the exact pattern uh, of the road sections that I'm rolling versus uh, the road sections inside the gate lining. So what I'm going to do instead is probably just make a bit of a um, uh, a little flagstone joiner or something that rather than trying to hide or disguise the edge which would never work I'll just make the edge a feature and put in some little flagstones as if they're decorative as part of you know the gate entrance uh, on either side so that should make it pretty interesting I think that will work so I'm gonna grab a whole bunch of my wood putty this stuff is uh, just a really generic uh, timber filler it's uh, different from the water putty that I was using before that has a lot more grit whereas this stuff is uh, it's you know it's really soft and kind of gelatinous and it's it's quite smooth and it gives a really smooth texture which is going to look really nice for that kind of marble cobblestone flagstone sort of a generic flat stone look um, and yeah it's a really really lovely material to work with uh, which you guys will see in a sec so I'll start putting that down and then we'll come back when we are ready to get our rolling pin action so this little piece here is going to be our insert for the inside of the gate so I'm going to line it up pretty much on the center and uh, let's just let's just see what we get pretty much and we just roll it through pushing relatively firm to put in a nice pattern. And look at that, how easy was that? 
We've got a little bit of uh, mist stuff on the sides because obviously uh, I've pushed pretty central. So what I'm going to do is just reset that little piece, which is pretty easy with wood putty because it's really forgiving. You just got to kind of flatten it around a little bit and that texture will just come straight back out. That should be good enough. Now we'll try and push nice and evenly right through the centre now. There we go, that looked fantastic. And now we've got a really nice even texture that's all the way across. It's a little bit splushed over here, I've stretched that out, so what I'm going to do is just come in and trim that back, just so we've got the same dimensions. Get rid of that bit there. And now that bit is ready to go straight into the inside. So I've just done this on a bit of blue plastic, obviously, so that I can just peel it off. And now I've got this little loose sheet here, and I will just take that in here and drop it in like so. Oh, easy as you like it. So I'll chuck a little bit of PVA under there and then uh, we'll make some little flagstones to buff that in and we can get on to making the main road. So it is the morning, uh, nothing is completely dry, so what I'm going to do is jump in with my heat gun and uh, try and accelerate that drying process of the first glue layer so that I can get my second glue layer down because we want uh, the first layer to be completely dry so that when I apply the second one I'm sort of applying additional bonding rather than diluting the first layer and just making that kind of into an even wetter mess. We want a really solid layer and then another dry solid layer on top of that. Um, the wood putty has turned out really well, it's not completely dry either, it usually takes about 24 hours hours but as it's drying it started to sort of shrink and expand to different places and crack and pull apart which is going to look absolutely awesome because it's made all these cracks that grass can come up through and it's going to look really really nicely aged once I've got that in. The other thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to take my heat gun while I'm heat gunning this stuff and is I'm actually just going to heat gun the foam a little bit uh, because this gets really hot and the foam, as you'll see in a sec, quite rapidly starts to melt. And what you can do is if you're careful and gentle is just start to apply the heat gun a little bit and create a few little depressions and bends and, and just kind of knock back this whole really flat landscape and get a little bit of a rise and fall to make it look like more of a realistic ground. And then from there I'll grab a whole bunch of multi-purpose filler and just sort of put a few kind of big rocks your lumps and, and smooth out this board edge and then that will be ready to hit with textured paint. So we've got a lot on this morning, let's jump into drying this glue layer and making our nice undulating foam surface. One thing to be careful of when we're using our heat gun to dry this rubble is that the heat gun will, of course, melt the foam, which we're going to see in a sec when we start doing our contouring, but we have to be careful of all of this foam around here where it joins the rubble pile, because if we start to melt that stuff, we're going to have these cavities forming underneath the rubble, which isn't going to look good at all. So if you just want to keep your movements nice and circular and, and kind of not sitting in one spot too long and really favouring that rubble pile and not kind of really sticking it right out here, and that way we shouldn't uh, have any gross holes. Alright, so now we're going to start to use our heat gun to make a few of these little depressions and uh, as you'll see, I'll just, you know, kind of work it in little areas. You don't want to get too down into the foam because you'll really bore it away quite quickly. It's amazing how fast heat does react on polystyrene. Um, if you've ever used a lighter or anything on it, you'll see how flammable it is. Uh, and it's exactly the same with high heat. So we'll just turn this on. See there, all you can see, I just held that for a little bit and now it just dips down a little bit and right, there's just that, you know, kind of rise and fall. So we'll do that to the whole thing just to give it a little bit of natural undulation and then we'll start going in with wood putty. Make sure you're wearing a mask when you do this because these vapors are fucking toxic. Vapor grade filters. 
So that's all we need to do. It doesn't take long. It's very easy. But as you can see, there's just, you know, a little bit of rise and fall in the board now. And it helps to get rid of that gaming board look and help approach a bit more realism. Now I'm going to grab my multi-purpose filler and just start to put a bit kind of more lumpy texture into it as well, which just forms the kind of basis of our ground layer. Right, so I've started just by knocking off all the edges and smoothing all around the board. Now we just come in with our putty, just like you guys have seen me do many times before, and start to build up uh, just a few little hills and mounds to give a bit of that rise off the flat. The other important thing, of course, is to also get in a bit of this stuff in and around the base of our all our buildings, the walls and the little armory stable, uh, just to make sure that you know it, it looks like that it's, uh, it's been there for some time and that there's dirt and eventually grass growing up against it. Um, don't stress if you get a little bit of the putty on the walls themselves. We'll be able to make that look like a bit of moss or aging or whatever. So the final layer of our ground detail is to take some textured paint or stone finished paint and fill in all of the gaps uh, anywhere that we've essentially got a bit of foam. Uh, it helps protect the foam from uh, kind of when we're hitting it with any aerosols, uh, but also it's just an extra layer of texture that we can really blend into the wood putty uh, and basically any time that we're not gonna have any grass covering it, uh, that'll then look like a bit of kind of rocky, dirty texture. Um, so it's, you know, it's, it's a, just a really fantastic way to ensure Sure that you don't have any really gross bits that glare out from underneath your grass layers and, uh, and kind of ruin the whole effect of your planes. Alright, so we're approaching the final stretch of the construction phase. Our uh, final layer of glue is down, which will finish off the rubble once that dries and cures. And our ground coverings are looking really nice. That textured paint with the putty and the uh, melted foam has created a really nice sort of texture that's going to be a great grounding for all of our grass work. Uh, the road is coming up really nicely. As it dries, it starts to shrink and, and contract even more. And we're getting lots of really cool cracks and stuff that's going to give the, uh, the road a really nice weathered aged look. So the the one thing that we still need to do is go in and clean up the final detail on all of our towers uh, and make sure that they look really nice. So I'm going to essentially grab a Dremel and uh, because some of the build elements are a little bit wonky when we use the chisel uh, to, to make our 45 degree angles, we've got a few sections that are kind of picking out and, and not really level. So I'm going to go through with the Dremel and grind down those corners just to smooth them all off and anywhere where there's massive gaps that don't look kind of... Uh, that fantastic. I'm going to take uh, a little bit of our uh, multi-purpose filler and pack that in there. But first of all, we're going to Dremel off all of our sharp corners. So uh, if we have a look on this side here, there's a fair few things that are poking out. We're just going to come in and grind all of those off. And then we also want to start to uh, take a, a big couple of chunks out of our, uh, our dodgy joins on the, uh, on the battlements here. So we'll grind through all of those, put in some beautiful aging, and then we can make that look all a bit rubbled and, and get a little bit of filler in here as well. So it's Dremel time. Let's get down to it. So with construction completed, that takes us to the end of the first part of this terrain series. Part two is going to be awesome. We're going to be covering all of the painting, the flocking, the ground coverage. We've got static grass, static grass tufts. It's going to be absolutely awesome. And of course, we've only got four feet of ramus at the moment, and the ramus is going to be eight foot long in the final board. So we'll be banging out the whole second half and lining up eight feet of wall, which will be very fun to see. And then looking further ahead, we've got all the Gondorian farmlands, some Gondorian homesteads, and of course, the big central Palinor field board where we've got orc camps and trenches filled with LED fire and heaps and heaps of corpses. It's basically going to be like a graveyard of Rohirrim in that central board, which I am super looking forward to putting together. It's going to be really fun. I hope you guys enjoyed this one. I really enjoyed banging this board out. It's been a, a real pleasure to build, so I hope you've liked it. If you have, let us know in the comments below. Like, subscribe if you're new around here, and of course, support us on Patreon if you want to support the channel. All the links and stuff are in the description. So thank you so much for watching. I've been Lachlan Linton Keen. You've been watching Zorpa Zorp Gaming. Keep on SPG Gaming, guys. Cheers.